thank you. Um, okay, so the way we're, we're going to run the format of this session um, is that we've got, we're joined uh, today by, or I'm joined today by four wonderful uh, barristers uh, from Quorum Chambers, um, Anna Walsh, Shiva Ann Cliff, Tosin Ogantayo, uh, and Shristi Shuresh. And um, each of those are going to speak and give you a bit of a flavour about what a day in the life of a, of a barrister in our practice area and their specific practice areas uh, within family law at Quorum Chambers and, and what that's like. Um, they might also give you a bit of an idea of how they got to the bar and their journey to the bar um, and whether they enjoy their job and hopefully they all do because they're here <laughs> um, selling it to you but um, I think they probably will um, but they'll, they'll give you a, an idea of that. Um, the reason we've done this um, webinar is because I'm very very conscious of the fact that many pupillages are not going ahead in chambers um, in the way that we hoped uh, and we expected and anticipated generally um, and that's obviously because of the pandemic and I might just very briefly explain to everybody because there is now a very big backlog for mini pupillage applications uh, and we just simply can't offer we don't at this stage like a lot of organizations we don't know when our working life will resume to some sort of normal uh, and when we'll be able to take people along to court with us again but you may be aware broadly at the moment we're not going to court um, for most of our cases as we, we, a few of us have been a few times since lockdown but that's about it and almost everything we're doing is remote um, and initially in this, in, in this um, pandemic the courts were very difficult about even pupils uh, attending hearings we've now fought for that and, and, and that's now routinely happening but our priority has to be our pupils uh, and it's just at the moment an environment where we're struggling to offer many people just so that's why we wanted to at least offer something um, to you all to give you a flavour of the sort of thing that you might have taken away from a mini pupillage albeit I accept it's nowhere near as uh, near as useful but it's something uh, and I'll finally just say this as well which is if you are applying for a pupillage at our chambers um, we're really conscious of the fact that you won't have had the same opportunities as people in the years before you um, because of the fact that, that this pandemic has meant that work experience opportunities have been so limited and um, so we certainly won't it's not a requirement that you do a mini pupillage with us to apply for pupillage uh, or indeed do any mini pupillages um, but we are obviously we encourage that if it's possible but we are, are really mindful of that and will be when we mark our, our next set of pupillage applications. I'm not going to focus on pupillage applications generally today um, because I think that might form another session another time but the idea of this is just to give you a favour of what our set is about, what, what work we do, uh, and uh, give you an opportunity um, to ask some questions, uh, which we will absolutely take uh, in about half an hour's time. So to kick us off, I'm going to ask Anna Walsh uh, to um, introduce herself and tell you a bit about a day uh, in her life. Um, Anna is on our executive board of Chambers uh, and she practices in mostly care uh, proceedings but other children work as well um, and she um, was I think a solicitor before she came to uh, the bar she's had a, a very uh, distinguished career and she's a, a force to be reckoned with within our chamber so I'll hand over to Anna. I don't think I can top that thanks Hannah that's very kind thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening um, I hope that you find this helpful um, and I wanted to start by saying that um, I'm not going to give you um, uh, some examples of what my life is like now in lockdown because it's very boring walking from one room to another room to do a hearing and then going back to the other room um, so I thought I would actually tell you about what my life was like when I used to go on a tube uh, and travel uh, and actually uh, go out and meet other people other than my husband um, and so I thought I'd tell you about that because it's a bit more interesting. So I was a nurse um, when I was much younger and I worked as a coronary care sister at Bart for a number of years. Uh, and then I decided that I wanted a career change and I decided to qualify as a solicitor. Uh, and so I did that and I qualified in 2004. Um, and then um, I got my higher rights of advocacy and did quite a lot of advocacy for local authorities um, and some parent work, but mainly local authorities. Uh, and then I decided um, to transfer to the bar. 
Um, and I did that in 2013 and I joined Quorum in 2015. Um, I was exempt from doing pupillage because I'd got my higher rights and I'd done enough advocacy hours that meant that I didn't need to do it. Obviously I had to get a training contract to be a solicitor. So I don't have experience of being a pupil, but I have interviewed people, uh, pupils as part of Quorum's um, pupillage application process. And I've also, I also am really committed to having mini pupils with me. And I try and have as many as I can, as often as I can. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, you would have seen that recently I said, uh, if anyone wanted to direct message me uh, and have a pupillage with me, I, I would do it. I, I was inundated and sadly then the lockdown came and that didn't happen. Um, and so I do completely appreciate how competitive it is to get pupillage, how you need to have not only very strong um, academic records, but you also need to have something else. And especially if you're going to do family law, I think you really do need to have something else. Uh, and that's compassion uh, and understanding and patience, I would say. Um, so Hannah was right. I mainly do care work, which is um, where a local authority brings proceedings because there's concerns about the standard of parenting that a child is having or children are having from their parents or primary carer. Uh, and I have entirely a court based practice. So if I'm not in court, I'm not paid. Um, I represent, I would say, some of the most vulnerable and dysfunctional members of our society. Um, and it, it is incredibly stressful at times. Uh, emotionally, it's challenging, it's upsetting. Um, and I really try to remember with every case that I do, that whilst tomorrow for me will just be another day in court representing another person, a parent, a child through their guardian or a local authority, that for that parent, their life will change forever after a final hearing in care proceedings, quite often not for the better. Um, and I think that is very much worth remembering because it's important uh, to remember that for, for the parents' sake uh, and also for your own sake. Um, and so my normal day starts where um, I would get up and obviously uh, whilst having breakfast, check my emails. Um, we have a lot of email traffic. We've recently gone paperless as a chamber, so everything is done paperlessly uh, and on email. And so I'd look at any practice direction documents um, that are sent to me overnight. Um, I would then go to court, meet with my clients, have a conference with them, quite often for the first time uh, of meeting them about their case. Uh, and then we will go into court and we will deal with their case. And not every case is based on someone giving evidence. Obviously, some cases are based on submissions where you speak to the judge and speak to the other lawyers to try to agree a way forward. And that, that happens a lot in a lot of family cases. Um, you will then um, obviously determine that case uh, and then leave court after having spoken to your client and go back to chambers. And nearly all of us in chambers have some additional responsibilities, whether that's within chambers, within doing management, uh, leading a team of uh, a practice group to try and advance it, attending marketing events. Uh, also, uh, lots of our members sit on committees, such as the Family Law Bar Hi, Association. Okay. Yeah, good. I'm just. <laughs> Sorry, I think someone is, oh yeah, they've, I think they've muted themselves now. Um, and so uh, we all have extracurricular activities and things that we um, have to do outside of our working day. Um, and obviously you are responsible to a large extent for your own marketing. Um, although the clerks do it for you and chambers do it for us, and we have require, thank goodness, you still have to attend events and obviously market yourself. So the days can be long and they can be tiring. And then when you've done all of those things, you often have to go home and prepare for the next day. Um, but it's a wonderful job. It's a privilege and it's a special job. Um, and it's very rewarding. It can also be um, incredibly upsetting and demoralizing at times for a number of reasons, but it is a lovely job. I I'm very fortunate and I don't forget that. There's not many jobs where you can sometimes finish a case at 11 a.m. and have the whole day free to yourself to go and do something else. Um, and so I think from that point of view, I, I know I'm incredibly fortunate. Um, I just want to finish by giving a few top tips on things that I have learnt over many years. Um, Self-care, it's so important in terms of caring for your mental health. This work is really quite taxing at times and full on and you have to perform every day. Uh, and it, it's hard sometimes when other things are going on in your life. So remember to be kind to yourself and take time. Uh, don't say yes to everything. There's a temptation when you first qualify to want to do everything that your clerks give you, to be everything to everyone, and you simply can't be. 
your clerks are there to support you, you want to do a job and you want to do it well because you want to be briefed by that solicitor again or have work uh, coming off the back of that work if you can. And therefore to do a job well is probably one of the best forms of marketing that you can do. Uh, don't worry when there are quiet times. You're not always going to be in court every day and it's going to be full on. I say make the most of those times because they're important. Uh, don't be afraid to ask. Um, in my view, the family bar uh, is it, certainly in London is friendly. Most people know one another and there's always someone that you can ask if you want to about something and don't feel that you can't because I think that's important. Most people I come across are kind and caring. And the final thing is never to adopt your client's case like it's your own child, your own money. That's not helpful. It doesn't allow you to be objective and give advice. You need to step back. If your client's aggressive, they often want a, a, a counsel that's aggressive. If that's not your style or the way that you are, then don't do that and don't be like that. It often achieves a better result by sticking to your principles, not alienating the judge uh, and being as firm as you can, but also being as fair as you can to allow the process of, of litigation to be fair. And that's really important. So I hope that's helpful. I wish you all luck on your journey. Remember that the bar has many different faces and there's many different ways to get there. So good luck to you all and thank you for attending this evening. Thank you so much, Anna. Those were really, really wise words. Um, we're next going to hear from Shiva Ancliffe, who's one of um, the most senior members of Chambers um, and has a uh, high profile practice in care proceedings and other children work um, and international practice as well, I understand. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand over to Shiva now. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, good evening. It's, it's lovely to have you all here, um, even though I'm really looking at myself and talking to myself on the screen, but um, I'm, I'm confident that there are people out there and it's not just uh, me, Hannah and the other few. Uh, but uh, seriously, it is a great privilege to be able to have this opportunity to talk to um, people who are considering the bar as their uh, career. And, and to capture people at a very early stage is uh, really very important. Um, we haven't had the benefit, um, as you've heard, of having people in chambers to have these conversations. And so this is a great opportunity. Um, there will be a chance, obviously, for us to speak and answer questions later on. So for the moment, I'm just going to really tell you about my experience of the bar, which has been fairly long standing. I was called to the bar in 1991. So I've, I've been around for a very long time. Um, I took a more traditional route than Anna. Um, I had known fairly early on, uh, even at school, that I uh, would more, more than likely have a career in the law. I came from a family with a legal background. And um, I therefore early on uh, pursued things that I hope would help me um, and public speaking was a big part of my life even before I went to university but I did a law degree and then um, I sought pupillage and when I started uh, at the bar um, pupillage was, was quite different to the experience that um, there is now and by and large pupillages were divided up into six month slots so in fact I ended up doing um, two uh, two sets of six months in different chambers, which actually, um, looking back, was hugely beneficial because it gave me very early on an experience of life um, in two different sets. And each chambers has a very unique and individual identity. Um, and having that as a, a pupil uh, really helped me to understand how different the bar could be and how varied uh, it was. Um, and also, I started the bar at a time where there was a lot less specialisation. So I didn't join a family set. Uh, of course, Quorum Chambers is a specialist family set. Uh, but back then, um, most chambers were what we call general common law sets. And so they covered lots of different types of law. Uh, and again, it gave me a, a unique opportunity to experience different areas of law um, in both of the two sets of chambers I, I uh, did my pupillage in. And uh, I didn't decide to specialise in family law until about 10 years later. Um, and I therefore had the opportunity of, of undertaking Crown Court trials and uh, personal injury work and general civil work, all sorts of <laughs> different varied things. Um, and I think that helped enormously to, um, first of all, help me to choose an area of law that I later wanted to specialise in, um, but also 
to really hone the skills that um, I feel as a family advocate I really need. And um, undertaking regular Crown Court trials uh, was something I think that really helped with um, the skills of advocacy. Uh, and so as a um, family specialist now, and um, for the last 20 plus years, um, it's right that I also, like many other people in chambers now, specialise within family in the area of public law. But I do also do other areas of work still. I undertake some private law work and I uh, also have a practice in um, international children work, which um, includes child abduction and, and relocation cases. Um, I do some forced marriage work, um, was involved historically in um, helping to uh, not draft the legislation, but pre, pre the legislation in the government's research uh, as to whether um, it was going to be of use to have uh, legislation in relation to forced marriage. Um, and, and there was a task force that um, undertook that work and I was one of those people. So I think coming to the bar, um, just to draw together some threads for you, does give you um, enormous opportunities, not just within the direct um, uh, sphere of work that you're undertaking, but to be able to use it as a platform to do other things within the area of law. Um, and so many of us are, as Anna has said, are on other committees and we help and support um, the whole vocation of being a barrister more broadly. So for example, I'm, I'm on a committee that uh, is to do with funding, which is run by the Bar Council. And we lobby the government in relation to um, amendments and changes on public funding. Uh, and these are all opportunities that come with, with being in the job. The advice I would give, um, give to, to um, anyone who's thinking about a career at the bar, uh, and of course, all of you are interested in doing mini, mini pupillage, is to really, um, when you have the opportunity and it all opens up again, is to really get as many experiences as you can because I think that will help you to understand uh, not just the role of a barrister and um, that we go to court and what we do day to day, but what it really is going to be like being in different types of chambers. Uh, because of course, whilst I'm sure um, we'd be delighted to have applications from, from, from you, um, every chambers has a very unique identity and one chambers is not representative of all of the other types of uh, chambers there are out there. So. So my top tip is to really try to get as many mini pupillages as you can uh, and get that sense of what the bar is really like. Um, the uh, London bar is also quite different to the provincial bar. Um, I did mini pupillages, for example, in Birmingham when um, I started, which is where I, I did my degree. And so I experienced life at the provincial bar, which is quite different to the London bar. So if, if some of you are thinking about um, perhaps applying more widely across the country, then also try to get that experience in mini pupillage if you can. Um, the things I think you need um, as a, a future barrister um, are real tenacity, I would say, to um, in this very um, uh, challenging time, um, and I think the bar becomes more challenging with each year that passes, but you need real tenacity to get yourself to where you need to be. Of course, you need strong academic skills as well, but you need tenacity, you need determination, and you need to show why you're better than the next person. Uh, and I don't mean that in some sort of unpleasant, ambitious, uh, critical way of your contemporaries, but really to find what your particular unique selling point is, what makes you better and sets you apart, uh, because it is obviously highly competitive. You need great focus and uh, obviously the fact that you're taking part in this and looking carefully at your uh, future career plans it is very important uh, and shows uh, that you need uh, and understand that you need a plan and strategy to get you to where you want to be. But once you achieve your ambition of pupillage and then hopefully tenancy, the skills that you will need to succeed at the bar um, as a long-term career uh, are the sorts of things that Anna talk to you about that uh, this is an incredibly challenging um, area uh, to work in. Um, the bar generally, but particularly family law, it's very emotive. Um, it can be extremely painful uh, to be part of the uh, cases that we're in. Um, however objective and professional you want to be, um, there are days where um, you of course will feel the hurt 
uh, that is taking place. So you, of course, need to be strong um, and you need to be compassionate and patient. Um, and I think another important thing uh, that I would say to anyone looking at a career at the bar is not to forget to always be courteous. It's a, it's a simple thing um, and often overlooked, I think, uh, with all of the pressure and clamour that goes on with our job. But being courteous, I think, is going to take you far um, in, in your careers. So those are the tips I would give you. What do I like about uh, this job? Well, uh, I, I like the fact that, that um, we help people um, at an interface of great challenge in their life. Um, we probably meet people at the point at which they are experiencing the greatest hardship that they will ever experience. Um, and it's a time for um, us to be calm and measured and supportive and be professional. Um, and so I love the fact um, that, um, that I have an opportunity every day to do a job that enables me to help someone in that way and to help to fight um, the injustice that does exist. And there is a great deal of injustice uh, out there. Um, so those are things I love about my job. The things I don't particularly like about my job, um, uh, giving you a, a, an honest answer, is that it is um, something that consumes you completely. And you uh, have incredibly long days. Um, and of course, anything that is worth doing um, is going to take your time. But let's not uh, mince our words. We are sometimes sitting at our desks working until two o'clock in the morning. And uh, of course, that's balanced by what Anna um, has told you, that uh, there are days where we might finish early in court. But on the whole, it, it is a very demanding job uh, where we work very long hours and we do that consistently. Uh, and what Anna has said to you about making sure that you take care of yourself and look after yourself uh, is critical because if you don't um, find a way of pacing yourself through a career as demanding as this, you will burn out. Uh, and so looking after yourself, making sure that you're uh, looking after your mental health and having breaks and doing enjoyable things and getting away from the pressures of this job by managing your diary, uh, managing your clerks, frankly, uh, at an early stage, is really important to make sure that you can uh, develop uh, yourself uh, as a barrister, succeed and be happy, uh, and to have a long and healthy career in the job. Um, well, currently we're not experiencing a great deal of travel because of uh, all that's going on in the country, uh, but um, when life returns to a new normal, I think travel is one of the things I don't particularly like about this job uh, because we have to do quite a lot of it. Uh, and finally, the last thing I think that um, I would say is that um, you have to wait around a lot. There's a lot of standing around waiting to get in and out of court. Uh, and so be aware of that. But I wouldn't hesitate to recommend uh, a life at the bar for anyone that prepared to put in the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva. That was really, really um, very helpful. Um, I should say that Shiva is one of the pupil supervisors in Chambers, uh, and we're now going to hear from one of our other um, pupil supervisors in Chambers, uh, Tosin Ogantayo. Um, Tosin um, is a man of style, as you can see um, his outfit for this evening. Um, he, is, he has a, um, a, a great practice in, and does a lot of money work, um, which is uh, uh, I don't think you've heard from any other money practitioners this evening um, and he also does children work as well um, but that uh, hopefully he can enlighten us on um, that side of, of chambers as well. Thank you. Thank you very much Hannah. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, well I was called to the bar in 2003 um, but I didn't get pupillage straight away so I think I'll tell you how I managed to get pupillage. Um, I started working for an agency called LPC, Legal Practice Clerks, um, which is a very good agency. I think they're still running now. Basically, they employ you to work as a solicitor's agent. So as long as you've uh, done the bar course, you can work in county courts dealing with small claims cases and mortgage possession cases. Um, I did that for 18 months. It's very, very good training for the bar actually, because you're going to court and you're arg arguing in front of judges. 
because the bulk of your cases are mortgage possession cases, you have to be very, very robust because you're the enemy and judges are trying to slap you down all the time. It's a very, very good training because you learn to stand up to a judge. You treat them with respect and deference, but you must stand up to the, to the judge and represent your client's instructions. I was very lucky. I did a case, a small claims before a deputy district judge. I won the case and then going back to, to uh, leaving the court, I bumped into him. We shared the train journey together and he said, apply to my chambers. I did so. And basically that's how I got pupillage. So it was very, very fortunate. Um, and so my advice to you is keep on, don't give up. You know, it's, pupillage is very, very hard to get, but if this is your what you want to do and you have that determination, keep on doing it, don't give up, opportunities, opportunities will come. So my main practice is uh, financial issues on, uh, after divorce and also children child custody issues. Um, that involves a lot of actual negotiation because although people think that um, going to court is all about fighting, there's a very, very strong emphasis on trying to reach agreement. So a lot of the work that I do is trying to get the, the, the swiftest outcome for the client. Um, it's not in your interest to take positions that extend proceedings for the sake of it. Um, nobody's gonna thank you if at the end of the day, they come to you and they've spent a lot, a lot of money and they don't get a good outcome. So it's always best to try and reach agreement. I also do a lot of cases direct access because obviously traditionally members of the public couldn't approach barristers directly, but that's changed now. And that's something definitely once you have qualified, I would recommend a lot of people do it because it's a large part of my practice now and it gives you much more flexibility. Um, you have uh, clients, it's, it's a win-win for everybody because for clients, it saves them money because they don't have to pay for a solicitor as well. But for barristers, you can charge more because you're doing a bit more work than the normal. Um, but it's that it's you have that flexibility and it's much more cost efficient for the client. Um, but it has it's it can be more tricky because people aren't used to deal with clients di directly. And I'll tell you a story about one of the cases that I did, which sort of gives a flavor of the qualities you need as a barrister. You have to be prepared to deal with things in the last minute, prepared for the unexpected. So I had a client that contacted Chambers. He had a four day final hearing trial starting on the Monday. He contacted me on Friday, begging to be represented. He'd gotten rid of his previous solicitors. Um, basically, there were assets of about um, over a million pounds. He had done nothing in the case. He would basically uh, put his head in the sand, hadn't complied with numerous court orders. And so the other side were basically going to go to court and get an order that they got everything because he hadn't complied. They said that he was hiding and he wasn't gonna get anything. He pleaded with me to represent him. Um, I said, okay, what papers do you have? He said, I don't have any papers. My solicitors still have them because I haven't paid them. For some reason, I decided to take the case on. So I turned up at Chelmsford County Court on Monday morning with no papers. All I knew was the brief background of the case. Fortunately, the case wasn't listed to start until two because the morning was going to be reading time and the judge kindly provided me an extra copy of the bundle. So I spent the morning at court preparing for a four day case. But, you know, fortunately we got a good outcome in the end. He got about 40% of the assets, which he was very, very happy with. But I think that's just an indication of the unpredictability of the, of the, the nature of this work. Um, and I think for the first, at least two, three years, of my practice, every time I went to court, my view was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be fined out. I don't know what I'm doing. But each time you overcome that, you just get stronger and stronger. And I think that's the way you do it. It's a very, very demanding job. But as long as you just have that self-belief, you can, you can do well. Um, so it's been, yeah, 17 years since I was called. And I can still say that 90, 95% of the time, I absolutely love this job. Um, it, there's nothing like it. You're, you're fighting for people's rights. It's a privilege to be able to do that. You're self-employed. Um, and so you have that control. Um, the parts of it that are difficult is that it comes with, a, there's a lot of pressure with this job, a lot of pressure, especially in the family law. 
because the expectations are very, very, very high. And so it can be quite demanding in that sense. But as long as you, you're able to have that balance and you, and you focus on your preparation, and I think uh, a big piece of advice that I would give you is that learn to develop very, very good analytical, analytical skills, but also learn to be able to identify the important points of argument. Because if you don't do that, you will never have a life doing this job because the volume of work, the amount of information that you have to go through, if you don't have the ability to be able to, to, to decipher what's important and know what to focus on, you will be overwhelmed. So that's a very, very good skill to learn as soon as you can, to learn to be able to identify what's important, what's key, and what the court and what judges are gonna be wanting you to address and be able to focus on that and you'll have a good balance. And so I, I definitely recommend the bar for you, but you have to have that determination and, and that self-belief. If you, if you have that and you have that focus, I highly recommend it. Thank you so much, Tosin. That's, that was um, very motivational. And um, we'll now hear from Shrishti, who is our newest member of Chambers. Um, she was a pupil with us last year uh, and happily taken on. And we took on both of our pupils um, last uh, year. They're both now our newest junior tenants. Uh, and so she can probably give you a flavour of what life is like as a pupil uh, at Quorum Chambers and now um, as a uh, fully qualified uh, barrister. Trishti, over to you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and hi, everyone. I think that I'm probably a lot closer to where you guys are uh, than I am to where any of the other speakers are. And actually, these are all people that had a role in training me. So it's like wonderful to sort of be speaking alongside them, but also really intensely nerve wracking. Shiva was actually my pupil supervisor as well. So, you know, I know she has a very in-depth knowledge of exactly how I was as a pupil. Happily, I think that worked out since I'm here now. Um, but look, I think my my journey to the bar um, was relatively recent in, in how it started, but also it was one that basically took me exactly through university. And this was not just the first sort of legal career I had, it was the first career I had at all. So dealing with all these things that you, you've heard about tonight, these incredibly difficult situations in which people find themselves and knowing that you have to do the part of it that's sort of managing their case from a legal analytical perspective, managing it from a common sense perspective, managing it from an emotional perspective, all of these things were new to me um, when I started the job. And I think that that's terrifying, but that's also very reassuring because you know that it's something that you can learn to do, provided, as as Tosin said, you have that eye for what's actually important. Um, but I think to sort of wind that back a little bit and tell you about how I how I ended up here, um, did I always know I wanted to be a barrister? I kind of had an idea that I'd like to do something that involved public speaking, but that could have been many things. Um, I thought the idea was cool. The more I heard about it, the more I thought, oh, is this the sort of thing that, you know, I'm going to be good enough to do? Um, and I, I, I tripped and fell basically into a law degree. I, I couldn't figure out whether I wanted to do law, whether I wanted to do English, whether I wanted to do politics. I, I'm one of those people where everything seems like a good idea to me. Um, but once I started learning about it, um, I've got to be honest, the really theoretical parts of the law didn't appeal to me, but I found family law. And that was like, whoa, just a completely new experience because... I had never seen an area of the law deal so closely with the sort of cultural, contextual and institutional parts of, you know, how people live. Um, it's so different to any other part of the law you're doing because it deals with the most intimate parts of people's lives. People are, you know, exceptionally affected, exceptionally invested in their families, however the situation might play out. And so it's right, I think Anna said earlier that and, and Shiva as well, actually, that you're dealing with people who are always in one of the hardest points of their lives. Um, and for me, particularly, what drew me into that area of the law um, was I had a background in doing quite a lot of academic things to do with the treatment of culture and race um, in the United Kingdom specifically, but all over the world. Um, and it's one of those things that obviously plays so directly culture into the notion of family and how that's treated on a case by case basis, but also regulated on something as big picture as the law. Um, that's the kind of balance that I was really deeply interested in. And the more I sort of uh, looked at how that played out, the more I saw that the place where that was addressed was in court. And so I kind of decided the family bar might be for me. Um, what my practice looks like at the moment, I am one of the pupils that started their, the practicing part of their pupillage exactly within the lockdown. So I've had the experience of basically doing all of my work remotely, bar maybe six or seven cases. 
Um, and it has its its good parts and bad parts. So the good part is, you know, most of my cases I've done in my pajamas. That tends to make it, you know, a little bit less nerve wracking. Um, but obviously the bad part is the time that you get in court, the kind of face to face interaction with people, the atmosphere of it all is something that you miss out on a little bit. Um, but I suppose the way in which that's panned out for me is reassuring because I was still able to get that level of training, especially at Chambers with what I was sort of offered to, um, you know, make up for the fact that I might not get that court time, more advocacy sessions, more sort of sessions on the minutiae of the law. These are things that are readily and ably provided to people who are in a situation where they might not get the traditional experience. And that's something that I hope is reassuring for all of you, because I know that, you know, you're all applying for this career in a time where things aren't as readily available as they used to be. Um, I also think that um, the part of this that's really struck me as being very, very different to the careers that a lot of my peers, for example, have is a self-employed element. You've had everyone talk about the sort of good and bad parts of that, but that agency over your own time as well, if that's the sort of career model that appeals to you, then this is definitely something that, you know, you should be exploring. Um, in terms of advice, I think for me, being at the stage that I am, what's been the most important thing for me is being in an environment where I know that I can find answers. Um, you're not necessarily expected, in fact, you're definitely not expected to know everything at the start of any career. I don't think anybody is. And it's a lot of pressure to feel like because you're sort of self-employed, because you're doing this on your own merit, and especially something like the bar where effectively the spotlight is on you when you are presenting your case. You know, you're not allowed to be wrong. You're not allowed to learn things as you go. But actually everything, every single case you do, every conversation you have with someone in the career it is an opportunity to learn more. Whether I'm looking at the way, you know, my opponent is presenting a case and thinking, oh, that's good. You know, I'm going to use that going forward or whether I'm sort of panic calling other other tenants and chambers, which which, you know, does happen to get answers about things that I've never seen before. Um, it's important rather than being somewhere where, you know, you feel like you have to be right all the time or you feel like you have to be on top of things all the time it's helpful of course it is because it's your own practice but I think it's more important that you're somewhere where you feel like you can ask people you can be taught um, especially during your pupillage year because that's the thing that you have to get through first um, it's somewhere where you know that you can sort of ask silly questions and be guided in the right direction and I think that alongside all the other skills that the other speakers have talked about, it, it's something really important that you're in that open communicative environment and that you're willing to be open and communicative in receiving something from it. Um, because no one's going to know what it is that you need unless you tell them. And I think it's, it's feeling also entitled, feeling able to ask. Um, that is something that's really important. And I think that actually ties into being able to decipher what is important so you can pursue more of it, not just in your cases, but but in life and in your approach to work. Um, there's a little bit I want to say as well on the sorts of opportunities that might be open to you right now, because obviously the ideal is that you, you do many pupillages, but those are few and far between, especially with family law at the moment. Um, but there are lots of other things you can do. Um, and I hope that this provides some reassurance for you, because some of the things that I did um, in lieu of getting, you know, actual court time were writing articles, publishing blog posts on issues in the law that were incredibly contemporary because, you know, short of actually being able to do things in court and getting sort of good publicity with solicitors, et cetera, for that reason, um, they might also come across something that you've written and think, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. And it's not something that lots of people have written about. I think for me, I, I published a set of articles in um, Family Law Journal about uh, the effect of gender and race on how courts treat radicalized children in cases that have that element to them. And it was obviously a very niche and specific set of cases that came out when, you know, IS was kind of taking over the news a little bit more. But um, it's these kinds of things where if you find an interest, because ultimately you pick your area of law because something about it is interesting to you, you can draw that out a little bit more. Um, there are also plenty of mentorship opportunities available th uh, through secondary organizations. So. I am a member of the founding committee of an organization called Bridging the Bar, which if any of you are on social media, we've got really dynamic social media manager. So we've been sort of all over the shop with that one. Um, but I think that we have just launched a, a mentorship scheme that pairs people with barristers who are sort of in um, varying stages of their career who can talk you through the application process start to finish. We're also launching a mini pupillage scheme where, you know, we'll try and address the discrepancy and opportunity. Um, to pair people up with chambers that might be able to sort of revise their opportunities a little bit for them. Quorum's actually a partner on that scheme as well. 
um, Themis, the Intersectional Women's Alliance, um, for, for those of you who self-identify as women, for example, uh, they have a lot of mentorship opportunities as well going. I'm also a member of their steering group. There are loads of other organizations out there that, you know, are either demographic specific or experience specific, and um, they're all very vocal. They're very ready to help. The bar, the self-employed bar specifically, is can feel, in fact, very isolating because you are um, working on your own. But it is actually a place where you can find a lot of camaraderie and a lot of support if you know where to look and if you're willing to sort of engage to find those opportunities. So they are out there. There are those other things you can do. Um, and, you know, if this is a career that you want to pursue, it's definitely something that will work out for you. So, you know, I wish you all the very best of luck in your application process. Thank you very much, Rishti. That was really, really helpful. Hello, uh, I'm third year student of LLB and I am considering bar. Mm. and I want to practice in England and Wales. When I see the statistics from the bar, uh, people who are getting pupillages, there is often one term is uh, often there that is called Oxbridge. And the second term, which I hear is from Russell Group Universities. Uh, I'm none of them. So um, I'm studying at a university which is not part of Russell Group and I want to go for the bar. And uh, whenever I talk to people about that and the reviews or comments they have, that is quite intimidating. Okay, you have done your DPTC or bar vocational studies, but what about the pupillage? They talk about the, you know, there are some groups, they dominate pupillage and things like that. So. That's the only thing which intimidates me. Otherwise, I'm good at my studies. I'm managing my first class so far, and hopefully I will manage that in my last year as well, in my law degree. So what do you, what do you say about that? That's a very good question, Kaleem. So basically, are we, um, do you need to have Oxbridge or, or, or Firsts or Russell Group Universities um, on your CV? Um, I can I marked pupillage forms um, last year and we have a really what I what I will say about our pupillage application process and I think perhaps we'll do it another session on, on specifically pupillage applications another time but I will say we have a very very carefully thought through marking process which means we are not placing too much weight on academics um, in our marking process you get some points for um, for uh, your, the, your class of degree or whether you've gone on to do a master's. We don't have any marks attributed to it being Oxbridge specifically um, at all in our marking process. Um, uh, but the bulk of, our, of the marks in our pupillage application process on the form, certainly to get an interview, um, would um, uh, is in experience, how you relate the experience you've had in whatever it is to, to being a barrister. So whether you've had experience in law or whether it's been um, in teaching or nursing or social work or we've had people who've been actors um, who've been able to say that performance skills are something that they're bringing to this job so there's so many different it, it's about how you relate your I would say it's about how you relate your experiences and your motivation um, into how you would be a good barrister uh, and obviously there's also an essay question on all, all our pupillage application forms and that is given a fair amount of weight so we're, we're judging people on, on their um, abil written abilities as we see them rather than, um, than importing prejudices about what universities they may or may not have gone to. I can't get away from the fact that, that a lot of the bar is very Oxbridge heavy um, but I would say that I think our chambers is, is one of the more diverse in terms of backgrounds that people have come from. Um, I want to do it. Does anybody, else, anybody else on the panel want to respond to that? Um, I'd quite like to just add to what you've said, Hannah, because I, I agree with everything you've said. Um, to just encourage you, um, Kaleem, that if if this is the career that you want to have, then you shouldn't be put off by what others tell you. I mean, it might be factually correct that, as Hannah says, that a lot of the bar is Oxbridge. But I can tell you that there are many, many opportunities still for people who aren't Oxbridge. And what you have to do is you have to decide for yourself if you're determined enough 
to break through uh, what you might perceive as a, as, a, as, a, as a ceiling for you personally and just push on. Uh, and if you want it badly enough um, and you do your preparation properly and you're uh, equipped um, to go into your application process fully and properly um, with your strong degree that you're working on now, then you have every chance of getting there. So don't, don't be put off by that sort of information. Thanks very much, Shiva. Any other questions? We had a hand raised from Mercedes Cooling. Mercedes, feel free to ask your question. Hi, thank you, um, and thanks for this event. I just wanted to ask, um, I only found my love for family law when I took it as an elective this year on the bar course. Will that be seen as a disadvantage when it comes to demonstrating a keen desire to practice at the family bar in pupillage applications, for example? Um, so I think I've, I, I think I've said um, we'll try and do a pupillage specific event because I think people will have a lot of um, uh, questions about that. But um, I, I, certainly I can say that I came to, to settle on the idea of family law after having done a number of criminal mini pupillages. And I decided actually, um, uh, having done one uh, family mini pupillage and uh, or got some family experience, that that was something I, I, I um, wanted to go into. Um, the short answer is no, as long as you can justify in your application why you're now settled on family law. Um, okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to input into, into that? Anybody else on the, from the panel want to say anything about that? No, don't worry. Okay, and I think I can see a hand up from Monica. Hi, uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's spoken this evening as well, it's been really helpful. Um, I wanted to ask a question based on something that Shiva said, which was when you're looking um, at chambers for mini pupillages or, or applying for pupillage, that to look at what that chamber's uni unique identity was. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask the, the speakers today what quorum specific unique identity is. Well, Monica, you're right on the money because my, my reserve question to ask the, the speakers if nobody came up with anything was what do we think Quorum's ethos is? I'm going to ask Anna to start with that because she's on our executive board at the moment. So our brand is very much um, her mission. Go ahead, Anna. Um, I would say what makes us unique. I think we are very diverse as a set. Um, we, uh, our core values, um, which um, amongst other things certainly are fairness, public law, doing legal aid work, um, being competitive. Um, I think they're all things that are very much part of our brand or certainly trying to slightly change our brand and push ourselves forward because you do need to be competitive. Um, but I think that there's lots of people within our set who do pro bono work for various organizations. I think that's really important, especially with the cuts to legal aid. Um, yeah, I think that we have, um, I think we're quite a unique set uh, in many ways um, and for all positive reasons, but I think that there are many things about us that, um, yeah, I think lots of our solicitor clients have been very loyal to us for, um, but, but certainly one of them is that, that we have a lot of diversity within our members, backgrounds, um, sort of, uh, different ethnic backgrounds, different backgrounds to get to the bar, um, and I think that's really positive. So I think that's quite, um, I think that's one of the things that people find quite positive about us. And also that we are in lots and lots of cases that make or change the law. And I think that's very positive about us too. Thank you, Anna. Um, does anyone, does anybody else in the panel want to add on a, our ethos? Um, I think the other thing I'd just like to add to what um, Anna's just said is that one of the things I would personally say that makes ch uh, Chambers so unique, having been in, what, probably this is my fourth set of Chambers, so I'm possibly um, more experienced of different uh, Chambers than others, um, is the incredible level of collaboration that there is amongst the tenants. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like uh, Quorum um, has in any other sets. I mean, there are obviously um, lots of lovely chambers to be part of, I'm not suggesting that they aren't, but the, the, the extent to which people will help each other um, in, in quorum is something I've never really experienced before and, and it, it's fairly extraordinary and it just makes this incredibly positive collaborative environment to work in that I think is really the pool that generates 
um, our success because we are all working incredibly hard um, to um, advance the law, to um, help people that are, you know, really on the edge of social justice all of the time. And it, it is that one factor, I think, for me personally, um, that makes us very different to lots of other chambers. Um, and it's this level of commitment and collaboration to each other. Thanks very much, Eva. That was that was great. I think one thing I would just also add is that we are, um, as well as having more diversity um, in terms of ethnic diversity, social backgrounds, um, we also have, a, a, I think, probably one of the highest percentages of female members of um, of any chambers. Um, of that obviously that is more common in, in family law. It's probably one of the few areas where where there are sometimes more uh, women than men. Um, but we are very proud, I think, of the achievements of our female members of chambers and a, a number of which have come on to become, gone on to become judges. So there's a real attitude of public service, I think, within our chambers uh, and giving back and uh, uh, as well as a very feminist ethos as, as well, I would say. Um, that might be just my personal view and what I, how I feel about it, but it's um, being around a, a group of high achieving, really high achieving, inspirational women, um, uh, senior women, um, as a junior member is something that I am very, very, very grateful for. Um, any, and I, I noticed at one point, Car oh sorry, I think, um, em well, I'll go come back to you in a second, Karen, I think Emily was next if Emily still had a, a question. Hi, yeah I actually had them um, exactly the same question as Monica but oh. thank you very much. <laughs> if we're at all, then Bethany, Bethany Knowles. Hi, um, thank you for this evening's talk, it's been really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask about what you think the impact has been on the cases that you're getting from the, the situation this year. Have you got like a lot of really different cases? Has the emphasis shift this year or has it has it I know you all have different areas within family and children's law, but obviously with the, the domestic abuse reports that have come out and everything, have the family changes cases changed? And also, do you think that the virtual legal practice is having an impact on the outcomes at all? Or do you think it's all like as is, but just online? Um, shall I suggest, Oggy, do you want to answer that? Well, certainly in, initially for the first couple of months of the lockdown, things were very, very quiet because the courts weren't really getting to grip to the with the virtual world. But I think from basically from August onwards, it's just been pretty crazy actually, because certainly in my area where you're dealing with child custody issues and breakdown of relationships, um, unfortunately the circumstances where people are, you know, relationships are placed on even greater pressure um it's it's a boom time and i don't think we've, we've actually even reached the the heights of it yet i think next year is just going to be crazy in terms of the family bar and that people are going to need a lot of assistance from the courts but also in terms of mediators and arbitrators just to resolve their disputes so you know so looking forward i think the family bar is 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 going to um you know be, be even stronger because of what's going on um, in terms of how things work in court, um, um, I think maybe um, some of the members who deal with care proceedings might be able to give a better input in terms of whether it has an effect on the outcome. Certainly from, from the type of cases that I do, it doesn't actually, it's, it, it's made things a lot more streamlined actually. And I think um, a lot of the cases that we do, you have sort of directions hearings, preliminary hearings, and then it's only the final hearing where you're gonna have contested evidence. I think going forward, I don't think you're going to get many directions or preliminary hearings that take place at court anymore, because it just doesn't make sense because of the cost and the time. It, it's, it's, it's very it's so much more efficient doing it online. I think it's only going to be final hearings that generally that you're going to have um, in-person hearings. But in some cases, they may not be necessary as well, but also they make it more feasible in some cases. For example, I was doing a, a finance case yesterday where the, the client was based in Lincoln. So it makes it, it gives it, it gives that much more flexibility. And so unless there's a specific reason why it must take place in person, I think the courts will facilitate the majority of cases continuing remotely. 
Thanks, Oggy. Um, in response to your point, uh, your question about whether there's been more domestic abuse cases seen or more, more care proceedings even, um, I think there was an initial lull. I think it's got busy again now. Um, I, I don't, I haven't personally seen a massive increase in domestic abuse issues. I, my theory, and my, my sister works as a social worker in this area, and my theory is that um, actually things aren't being noticed as much. So there may be more domestic abuse going on, but it's not being picked up quite as much as it was because of the lack of professional sort of monitoring and help. Um, but that's just my theory and it may be entirely anecdotal. Shwishti does quite a lot of, as one of our more, most junior members, she's probably doing the most um, injunctions and non-molestation orders and things like that. Shwishti, what have, what, have you got anything to add to that? Um, I think in terms of the practices being virtual, I, I agree with what, um, what was said about things being more streamlined. Um, I would say the only difficulty is sometimes your clients, when they're very vulnerable, they are reassured by sort of knowing who is representing them, being able to see the face of who's sort of speaking for them and being around them, getting a little bit used to them. Obviously, as a barrister, you don't have as much client contact as, you know, the solicitor who's preparing your case would. Or if you're instructed direct access, you're still really only there for the purpose of the hearing, which will be however many days that goes on for. Um, but I think in a sense that 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 level of comfort, just knowing who is going to be in court discussing the most intimate details of your life, but also the practical considerations, like, for example, sitting in court and knowing that if your client has something to say, they can sort of tap you on the shoulder or pass you a note. Um, that's all been made much more difficult now, especially with telephone hearings, which are kind of what I do more often. Um, I think that, you know, they're having to sort of speak up for themselves a little bit more when when, you know, for example, a barrister doesn't know the answer to a detail that the judges ask because it's not it's not formed part of their instructions it might not even be directly relevant and so they ha they have to get involved a little bit more for practicality's purpose and for some of them that can be quite you know disarming um so i think in that sense um with telephone hearing specifically uh, it has caused a little bit more difficulty pragmatically um but i think where it's things like zoom hearings or teams hearings um you know there are other facilities where they can sort of talk to you they can update you as things are going on issues always crop up during the hearing which you need sort of immediate, immediate instructions. Um, but other than that, I think the sort of actual case management portion, the hearing of cases and lack of travel, that's definitely all been streamlined. I would agree with that. Thank you, Shristi. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, respond very briefly to Stephen's comment in the sent to everybody um, in the chat. Um, I just want to be um, clear, my views are about what I value about our chambers being feminist. Um, I would say my view is also that 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 is doesn't that is not a statement about having um, no men in chambers or having no men coming through. Um, men, men, the, um, I would expect men to be feminist as well in the way they go about things. Um, and uh, the current statistics on uh, uh, women at the bar is that there's 38 percent of the bar is women. Um, if you took out family law from that, you'd be down to about 10 percent. And you may have seen the bar standard boards. Uh, report uh, just last week about how much less women at the bar generally are earning than men. So there is a need, in my view, for us for there to be a, a chambers that champions um, uh, women at the bar. And um, I am very, very proud that we are uh, one of them, in my view. Um, I'm just going to ask, um, I, we're nearly at the end of our um, our session. We've slightly gone over, but I know that Karen had his um, hand up earlier. Um, so I will just give Karen an opportunity um, uh, to, to speak. Uh, hello, thanks uh, everyone, or oh, thanks all the speakers and Kurum. Uh, so I am Karan, I'm an Indian and I am an LLB graduate. I just completed my master's in human rights. So one thing I've noticed amongst a lot of international students and immigrants is that we particularly find it far more challenging to get called to the bar. What does the bar do to address challenges of international students slash immigrants? And how does the bar facilitate inclusivity? Um, who wants to answer that? Um, Anna, do you want to? Or, oh, okay, go ahead. I, I think certainly from my experience, Karen, because um, I've been on numerous um, uh, pupillage interviews, pupillage uh, marking, pupillage assessments. And I think the key thing is that you have to have firstly the background in terms of your, of your academics. 
um, if you have that sorted out, because you know re realistically you have to have a minimum of two one now. If you have that, then whether you're an international student or not, the key thing that then that's that's going to differentiate you is your own personality, your own character. And that's that's always been my big advice to people who want to know how can they stand out or how can they be successful when they're applying for chambers is that as long as you have the basics in terms of the fire, your, your academics, you have to as as much as possible demonstrate what is unique about you, what you have to offer. As a as a as, as a member of a pupillage panel, that's what I, what I was always looking for, because everybody gets two on and lots of people are getting first. That's not enough. I want to see what differentiates you, what makes you special, what makes you different. So if you can focus on the fact that as an international student, you're going to bring something probably completely different to a lot of the English students or local students. If you focus on that, it can be an advantage. So as long as you have that basic academic uh, grounding, don't see that as a as a as a as a as a, as a detriment to your your ability to, to be successful. Thank you so much for getting that. That was um, a brilliant way of putting that. Um, I think that probably brings us to an end. Um, thank you very much, all of you, for, for being on here. I know this doesn't replicate um, a mini pupillage. Um, it's not the same. You haven't had the exposure to, to the cases. Um, that, that you might have had, but we will try and get mini pupillages up and running as soon as it is practical um, and, uh, and as soon as the courts really are, are uh, going to allow it, which I hope will be um, sometime next, uh, hopefully early next year. We can all hope um, that a vaccine might make some progress on, on things. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we will try and run another one of these sessions more specific to pupillage applications um, in the early new year. And I would just signpost you to the Bridging the Bar, which Shristi talked about, uh, which has got some great scheme, mentorship schemes. Um, the the um, Inns of Courts also have mentorship schemes uh, and schemes for marshalling with a judge. And uh, those are really, um, I don't know whether that's still running, but that, in normal times, that's a really good way of getting some experience. Um, you'll see that there is a way, the very prohibitive costs of the BPTC, and there are options for applying uh, for um, scholarship funding for that through the Inns of Court. They've got very large pots of, of um, money there specifically for that because everybody recognises quite how um, how prohibitive it could, that those, those costs of, of the course can be. Uh, and the time deadline for that, I think, is September the September before you start the BPTC. So I just wanted to flag that as something that you might want to, to think and plan about. And um, Kaleem, I won't take another question at this point, but what I will suggest is that if anybody has any burning questions, you're very welcome to tweet um, them to uh, the Quorum Twitter account, which Rakaya has put the link to in the chat um, and we're easy to find. Um, and our, we'll try our, our best to answer some of those questions on Twitter and, and set up a, a something more specific to pupillage applications uh, in the new year. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, this evening um, and, um, and for all of you for your time and for your, your um, very engaged questions. Thank you.